Do you know someone who doesn't steal, doesn't run with a bad crowd, gives thanks to God for his blessings, prays, fasts, even gives generously to the church and to the poor, someone who does all that is required and more, but for all the evident devotion is still not saved? That's because pious acts don't improve our standing before God. Welcome to Every Last Word, a radio and internet program with Dr. Philip Ryken, teaching the whole Bible to change your whole life. We're continuing our series on the theme of salvation, called The Message of Salvation. Phil, in your message today, you talk about our need for atonement and how that's at the center of Christianity. Why do people struggle with that? Well, they they do struggle with it, don't they, Mark? They know about Jesus, and they've maybe heard some things about Christianity, but they don't understand why Christians make such a big deal about Jesus dying on the cross. I think ultimately it's because people don't want to accept the idea that they need atonement. If you accept that, then you have to accept that you're a sinner, that you're really alienated from God. And I think instead people say, well, why would I even need somebody to die for my sins? How does the account of the Pharisee and the tax collector help us understand our need for salvation? You know, Mark, in this uh, story, we get a clear contrast, and there was a strong difference between these two men, the Pharisee and the tax collector. We'll see it in the passage we're looking at today. And the difference was that one of those two men knew that he needed atonement for his sins, and the other one didn't. The Pharisee was always comparing himself to others, and by that standard, he looked pretty good. But the tax collector compared himself to the perfect standard of God's holiness, and by that standard, he knew that he was a sinner, and he knew that he needed some kind of atonement for his sin. When we finally understand that about ourselves, Mark, then we'll recognize our own need for atonement, the atonement that Jesus offered on the cross. Thanks, Phil. And and we'll see that today as we look at our text in Luke 18. Let's turn there now and listen to God's Word for us today. We've been having a series of sermons on the message of salvation and One of the things we're beginning to see is that there is more than one way to describe the saving grace that God gives in Jesus Christ. Salvation means deliverance. It is a rescue from sin's power by God's mighty acts. And salvation means redemption. It is a release from sin's bondage by the payment of a ransom. Tonight we discover that salvation also means atonement, that is, the removal of sin's penalty by the offering of a sacrifice. And perhaps I should say that again. Salvation means atonement. It means the removal of sin's penalty by the offering of a sacrifice. Now, atonement is not a very popular subject these days. It deals with too many things that people would rather ignore, like the wrath of God and the punishment of sin and the old blood-stained cross. Most unbelievers do not see their need for atonement. Why would anyone else have to die for my sins, they ask. And for their part, many Christians do not understand the meaning of the atonement. The notion of a blood sacrifice for sin sounds primitive, perhaps even barbaric. Therefore, the biblical doctrine of the atonement has all but disappeared from contemporary theology. It was not always this way. Back in the 19th century, the Scottish theologian John Brown said, Let a man preach with the greatest ability and zeal everything in the Bible but the cross, and he shall preach in vain. The doctrine of the atonement ought not to be the sole theme of the Christian ministry, Brown went on to say, but every doctrine and every precept of Christianity should be exhibited in their connection with this great master principle. And the leading object of the preacher should be to keep the mind and the heart of his hearers steadily fixed on Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus crucified. Now, Jesus himself once told a story to help explain our need for atonement, why this doctrine should be at the center of Christianity. And he told it to a group of people who were quite sure that they needed no such thing. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. The story concerned 
two men, two prayers, and two destinies. Two men went up to the temple to pray, said Jesus, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And already the story contains a surprise because everyone knows that tax collectors do not go to the temple. And if they do, they certainly do not go there to pray. A praying tax collector is a contradiction in terms. In the time of Christ, tax collectors were considered the scum of Jewish society, and with good reason. They were in the employ of the oppressive Roman government. Thus, they were considered traitors to the Jewish people. They were greedy and dishonest, most of them, usually relying on extortion for their profit margin. Oh, make no mistake about it, this tax collector was a crook. The Pharisee, by contrast, represented everything that was right and good in Jewish society. The historian Josephus described the Pharisees as a body of Jews known for surpassing the others in the observance of piety and exact interpretation of the laws. It was only natural, therefore, for this pious Pharisee to go up to the temple to pray because that is exactly where he belonged. Now, in some ways, our respect for this Pharisee is increased when we overhear him at prayer. This Pharisee was a man with very few obvious vices and with many commendable virtues. He was thankful to God, for his prayer begins with thanksgiving. He did not steal, which, as everyone knew, tax collectors always did. He did not run with a bad crowd. He was faithful to his wife. In short, the Pharisee kept the whole law of God. I suppose today he would be a respected elder or a beloved minister in the church. Furthermore, the Pharisee went well beyond the law in his devotional practice. The law stipulated only one fast a year, but this man was fasting twice a week, a hundred times more often than the law required. He also set aside one-tenth of everything that he received. This, too, in a way, was more than the law required, for the biblical tithe only applied to certain kinds of produce, but not to other forms of income. And yet, for all his devotion, this Pharisee remained unsaved. None of his pious acts improved his standing with God, who does not base his judgment on outward acts of religious devotion, but on the inward disposition of the heart. What was wrong with the Pharisee, you might ask? What was wrong with his prayer? Well, his most obvious problem was pride, of course. Although he began by addressing God, he spent the rest of his prayer talking about himself, In fact, in these two short sentences, he manages to mention himself five times. In the words of one commentator, he glances at God but contemplates himself. And in fact, he does something even worse than contemplate himself. He actually prays to himself. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, or more literally, the Pharisee stood up and prayed with himself or even to himself. He was not praying to God at all, for the Pharisee prayer was just another way of reminding himself what a great guy he was. The Pharisee was so conceited that he refused to admit that he was a sinner. And you see, here we come to the very heart of the message of salvation that we've been preaching about in this series. We've seen that the salvation God offers by His grace is only for sinners. Therefore, being saved begins with confessing your sins. Really, the only people who ever truly ask God to save them are people who know that they are guilty sinners. The Pharisee never saw himself that way. Rather than admitting that he was as depraved as everyone else, he thanked God that he was not like other men. Put it bluntly, the Pharisee did not understand the first thing about salvation— which was his own need to be saved from his sins. Nor did the Pharisee understand that he could only be saved by grace, 
Instead, and rather obviously, he expected to be saved by his works. He thought that God would accept him on his own merits. After all, he was a good person. He was much better than most, in fact, and so he must be good enough for God. The Pharisee had so much faith in his own ability that he had no need to trust in God. And this, too, strikes at the heart of the Bible's saving message. For we have seen that we are sinners who will not cannot come to God on our own. Only God can save us, and only by His grace. Now, there were two men who went up to the temple, two men who prayed two prayers and met two destinies. And unlike the Pharisee, the tax collector received atonement for his sins. Rather than counting on his own merits, he was begging for God's mercy Verse 13, the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, you may notice that there were three parts to the tax collector's prayer. God, the sinner, and the mercy that came between them. His prayer started with God, which is where all true prayer must begin. The first act of prayer is to approach the majestic throne of the Almighty God. Now, the Pharisees' prayer began with God as well. Perhaps you noticed this. But the difference was that the tax collector had some idea who he was addressing. And when he said God, he meant the one true and supreme deity who is awesome in his holiness. This is apparent from the tax collector's posture. He kept his distance He refused even to look up to heaven, and surely this was because he had a proper fear of God's bright, burning holiness. There's an old poem which illustrates the difference between the way the Pharisee approached God and the way the tax collector approached him. It goes like this, two men went to pray, or rather say, one went to brag, the other to pray. One stands up close and treads on high, where the other dare not send his eye. One nearer to the altar trod, the other to the altar's God. The poem's last two lines answer the question, who was closer to God, the Pharisee or the tax collector? The point is that the Pharisee was much nearer to the altar And yet he was much farther away from God. He was so full of himself that there was hardly any room for God at all. By contrast, although the tax collector may have been far from the altar, he was close to the heart of God, for he came in reverent fear. The reason for his fear was that he knew that he was a sinner, which is where his prayer ended. He began with God, but ended with himself a sinner. Or to put it more accurately, he ended with himself the sinner, as if he were the only sinner in all the world, for that is what the Greek says. It uses the definite article because as far as the tax collector was concerned, he was the only sinner that mattered. Rather than comparing himself against all the others the way the Pharisee always did, the tax collector measured himself against the perfect standard of God's holiness. And by that standard, he saw himself as nothing more and nothing less than a guilty sinner before a holy God. And when it came to confessing his sins, the tax collector's actions spoke as loudly as his words. He stood at a distance because he sensed that he was separated from God, that he was alienated by his sin. Nor did he dare to look up to heaven as was the usual custom No, he felt unworthy to seek God's face. He was so weighed down by his guilt that he felt compelled to lower his shameful gaze. And all the while, he was beating his breast, which was still another sign of his contrition. This tax collector was a self-confessed sinner. And unlike the Pharisee, he did know the first thing about salvation— He knew that he was a sinner who deserved nothing but God's wrath. 
And if you yourself would be saved from the wrath of God, this really is the very first step, and that is to admit that you are, in fact, a sinner. When this tax collector calls himself a sinner, we should take him at his word. You know, this parable is so familiar to many Christians that we have come to think of this tax collector as a rather sympathetic figure. After all, there is something heartwarming about a man bowing down to confess his sins. But the tax collector was hardly a role model. On the contrary, he was every bit as bad as he said he was, if not worse. In his commentary on these verses, T.W. Manson wrote, The publican is overwhelmed by the sense of his own unworthiness, and rightly so. It is a great mistake to regard the publican as a decent sort of fellow who knew his own limitations and did not pretend to be better than he was. No, this publican was a rotter, and he knew it. He asked for God's mercy because mercy was the only thing he dared to ask for. Now, the mention of God's mercy brings us to the most striking feature of the tax collector's prayer. For in between God's holiness and his own sinfulness, he inserted a prayer for mercy. The Greek verb, which is translated, have mercy, is an unusual one. It's the verb holoskomai, which means to propitiate or to expiate. In other words, to atone for sin by means of of a blood sacrifice. Now, those are complicated words. I want to explain what they mean tonight, but in order to do so, it's necessary first to understand how sacrifices were offered at the temple. A good place to begin is with the procedure for making atonement given in Leviticus chapter 16. In fact, you might want to turn there. I'm talking about what it means to atone for sin, and the procedure for atonement is described in Leviticus chapter 16. Once a year, the high priest was to make atonement for the sins of God's people. And he was to begin, as we find mentioned first of all in verse 6 and then again in verses 11 through 14, he was to begin by offering a bull to atone for his own sins as well as the sins of his household. And then he was to take, and this is given in verse 9, he was to take a perfect male goat and sacrifice it as a sin offering. This is what God said, verse 15. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. And in this way he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites whatever their sins have been. And it goes on to say in verse 17 that in this manner the high priest made atonement for himself, for his household, and for the whole community of Israel. Now what did all this signify? Well, the goat represented God's sinful people. In a symbolical way, the sins of God's people were transferred to the goat. Ordinarily, before an animal was sacrificed, the sinner would place his hand on the animal's head while he confessed his sins. This was to show that the sinner's guilt was being charged to the animal. To use the proper theological term for it, the sinner's guilt was being imputed to the animal, and then the animal, in this case a goat, was sacrificed on the altar. It was put to death and then often afterwards burned. And you see, it was necessary to put the animal to death because once the sins of the people were imputed to the goat, the goat had to die. The wages of sin is death. And so once the goat was made to bear the people's sins, the goat had to suffer the punishment for sin. In effect, the goat was a substitute dying in the place of sinners. Now once that sacrifice had been made... The sacrificial blood was the proof that atonement had actually been made for sin. This is explained in the next chapter, in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, where God says, It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Leviticus 17, verse 11, It is the blood that makes atonement 
for one's life. You see, the reason the blood takes away guilt is because it shows that God has already carried out his death penalty against sin. No further punishment remains. The blood is the proof. What the priest did with that blood was to sprinkle it on the atonement cover, also called the mercy seat. It was the golden lid on the Ark of the Covenant. It was located in the most holy place of the temple. And because it was the lid on the Ark of the Covenant, it was the earthly location of God's presence. Therefore, sprinkling blood on the mercy seat was a way of showing that the atoning sacrifice had come between God and his sinful people. Now, when it was placed between God and sinners, there were two things that the sacrificial blood accomplished, and they are expressed in two rather technical theological terms, and the terms are expiation and propitiation. We don't often use these terms, but we probably should because they are the very best terms to describe what was actually happening with the sacrifices of the Old Testament and also, as we will see, with the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Expiation refers to the covering of sin. It explains what the sacrifice accomplished with respect to sinners and their guilt. Their sin was covered. Their transgression was put away. Their guilt was removed and their iniquity was pardoned. Expiation is what David meant when he wrote, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Once the blood of the sacrifice had been sprinkled on the mercy seat, the penalty for sin had been paid, and no further guilt remained in a word. The sins of God's people were expiated. Then there is a second thing that the blood accomplished, and that was propitiation. As I say, it's a difficult word, and yet it is necessary to use because it best describes an essential truth of salvation. Propitiation refers to the turning away of anger. It explains what the atoning sacrifice accomplished, not with respect to the sinner, but with respect to God and to his wrath. Now, wrath is one of the most frequently mentioned divine attributes in the Bible. It's mentioned nearly 600 times in the Old Testament and many times in the New. Wrath is not a violent emotion or an uncontrollable passion. No, it is much more like righteous indignation. And therefore, it is easy to see why it is good and right for God To have this attribute, it is one of his perfections. It is right for God to be opposed to every evil thing. Wrath is simply God's holy opposition to sin and his personal determination to punish it. God's wrath explains why the high priest never came into God's presence without the blood of a sacrifice. If he came without the blood, he would be destroyed. However, once The sacrifice had died in place of the sinner. No punishment remained, and the priest could simply sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat to show that God's justice had been satisfied, in a word that God's wrath had been propitiated. To put it another way, the sacrifice had made God propitious. It had allowed him to look upon the sinner with favor rather than with anger. Now, you see, by coming between God and the sinner, the blood sprinkled on the mercy seat was both an expiation and a propitiation. Through the atoning sacrifice, the sinner's guilt was expiated, and God's wrath was propitiated. With respect to the sinner, the blood was an expiation. It covered the guilt of his sin. And yet, with respect to God above in heaven, it turned away the justice of his wrath. When the blood of the sacrifice was sprinkled on the mercy seat, the sinner was protected from God's wrath because his sins were covered. Now, here is the striking thing. And that is that this is precisely what the tax collector was praying for when he said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. 
There the man was, praying in the temple where atonement was made for sin, where the sacrificial blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. He knew that he himself was under God's wrath because of his sin. The only thing he could do was ask for mercy to come between his guilt and God's wrath. To put it more precisely, he begged for God to be mercy seated to him. But that is what the Greek verb holoskomai literally means. The tax collector was asking God to atone for his sins, to cover his guilt, to protect him from eternal judgment, in a word, to be mercy seated to him. The order of the tax collector's prayer is significant because it matches the Old Testament pattern for sacrifice. God be propitiated to me, the sinner. First comes God who is perfect in his holiness. Last comes the sinner who deserves to die for his sins. But in between them comes the blood of the sacrifice, which both expiates and propitiates, which takes away the sinner's guilt and turns away God's wrath. Now the question for us tonight is where can we find mercy? For like the tax collector, we are sinners in need of a Savior. And since God hates sin, we are under His wrath. And the only thing that could possibly save us would be a perfect sacrifice. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But where is the blood? Where is the sacrifice? Where is the mercy? We do not have any altar in the church. We do not keep herds of sheep and goats to make atonement for our sins, nor could we, for there is no temple where we could make a sacrifice, no mercy seat where we could sprinkle the blood. The answer, of course, is that Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, the only sacrifice we need. The great preacher and hymn writer John Newton once wrote of this in his diary. At the time, Newton was weighed down by guilt. And as he lamented his lost and sinful condition, he wrote, But now I may, I must, I do mention the atonement. For although I have sinned, Christ has died. Newton understood that God is mercy seated to the sinner through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. His death is our substitute. His cross is our mercy seat. And the blood that Jesus sprinkled there is both the expiation for our sins and the propitiation of God's wrath. You know, the New Testament so often describes Christ's death on the cross as a sacrifice. It wants us to understand the work of Christ in terms of the whole sacrificial system of the Old Testament. It wants us to understand that like the goat offered on the Day of Atonement, that Jesus is the substitute who has died in our place. And when we say that Jesus died in our place, we mean that his sacrifice accomplished exactly what the blood on the mercy seat accomplished. His death on the cross was First of all, in expiation, it was the removal of our sins. Remember the time that John the Baptist saw Jesus coming and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. John was identifying Jesus as the sacrifice for our sins. So that like the sacrificial lambs of the Old Testament, Jesus would die in our place. And our sins would be transferred to him, that they would be imputed to him. And this is what the scripture says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. It's a way of saying that our sins were transferred to Jesus, that Jesus was bearing our sins on the cross. There on the cross, he suffered the punishment that his people deserved for their sins, death by the wrath of God. And you see, now our sins are covered. They were punished on the cross, and no further penalty remains. Christ was sacrificed, the Scripture says. This is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. Or again, 1 Peter chapter 3, Christ died for sins once for all. 
In a word, the crucifixion was an expiation. And then in the second place, Christ's death on the cross was also a propitiation. Now let's just review this. It's a difficult term. Let's remind ourselves what it means. Propitiation is the act of performing a sacrifice by which God's wrath against sin is averted. And this is precisely the kind of sacrifice Jesus offered, a sacrifice to turn away God's wrath. On four separate occasions, the New Testament describes the death of Christ as a propitiation. Unfortunately, we might say the New International Version translates these verses with the phrase, atoning sacrifice. But really, what the Scripture means is propitiation. Romans chapter 3, verse 25, God presented Jesus as a propitiation. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, Jesus had to be made like us in every way so that he might make propitiation for the sins of his people. Or again, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, he is the propitiation for our sins. 1 John chapter 4, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the propitiation for our sins. And what all of these verses are telling us is that not only has Jesus' blood covered our sins, but it has also turned away God's wrath against them. Thus Christ's death on the cross has these two great saving effects. It expiates our sin and it propitiates God's wrath. And this brings us to a very personal question, and that is simply this. Has God been mercy seated to you? Has God covered your sins? Have you received atonement for your guilt? Or do you remain, even tonight, under the wrath of God? You know, the end of the story that Jesus told presses this question upon us with the greatest possible urgency. Two men went to the temple to pray, a Pharisee and a tax collector. And there they offered two very different prayers. And as a result, they went home to meet two entirely different destinies. The tax collector got what he asked for. His prayers were answered. God was mercy seated to him. His sins were covered. God's wrath was turned aside from him. In other words, the tax collector received both expiation and propitiation. The expiation and propitiation he needed to be saved. And so Jesus closes his story with these words as we find them in verse 14. I tell you that this man, that is to say the tax collector, rather than the other, that is the Pharisee, went home justified before God. Now we will have more to say about justification later in this series. To be justified is to be counted righteous. And this tax collector was not counted righteous as the result of anything that he had done because all he had done was sin. Now he was justified by God's mercy on the basis of the atoning blood of a perfect sacrifice. But God did not justify the Pharisee. No, the parable is very specific on this point. The Pharisee was never declared righteous. And so he went home unjustified. And even after all of his righteous acts, he himself was still unrighteous. And in a way, I suppose all his righteous acts were part of his problem. He was so busy being self-righteous that he could not receive God's righteousness, which only comes as a gift. As long as the Pharisee was counting on his works to save him, he could never be declared righteous. He would remain forever under the wrath of God. And the point that Jesus was making was that sinners cannot be saved by what sinners do. Sinners can only be saved by what God has done. In other words, sinners can only be saved by grace. You know, the Pharisee's prayer was all about what he could do for God. That's why all the verbs in his prayer are active. I thank, I am, I fast, I give. What made the tax collector's prayer different was that he was asking God to do something for him. And the only verb in his prayer is passive, God have mercy on me, or God be mercy seated to me. 
And so I ask you, what are you counting on tonight and for all eternity? Something that you have done for God or something that God has done for you? You know, if you want to be mercy seated, if you want God to be mercy seated to you, all you have to do is ask. Earlier I quoted from Romans chapter 3, God presented Jesus as a propitiation. The scripture goes on to say this, a propitiation through faith in his blood. In other words, the death of Jesus only serves as an expiation and a propitiation for those who trust in his saving work. Atonement always requires faith. It required faith in the Old Testament. When the sinner placed his hand on the head of the lamb to confess his sins, he was exercising his faith, trusting that God would transfer his sins to the sacrifice and deal with them there. You know, sinners do the same thing at the cross of Jesus Christ. In one of his many hymns on the atonement, Isaac Watts imagined himself placing his hand on Jesus' head, the way that sinners used to put their hands on the sacrifice, and saying, My faith would lay her hand on that dear head of thine, while like a penitent I stand and there confess my sin. What Watts was meaning to say in his hymn is what we are saying tonight, and that is lay your hand on Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. And there confess your sins, asking God to transfer them to Jesus Christ, your substitute. Then believe that God has been mercy seated to you through the death of Christ on the cross and through his blood shed to be the expiation of your sins and the propitiation of God's wrath against them. Our Father in heaven, we give you praise for this great salvation, which deals with all the difficulties of our sin, which removes our guilt, which takes away your wrath. And we give you praise that you yourself have turned away your own wrath through Jesus. And even now we trust in him to save us from our sins by his blood. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. You're listening to Every Last Word with Bible teacher Dr. Philip Ryken, a listener-supported ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. The Alliance exists to promote a biblical understanding and worldview. Drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformed theologians from decades and even centuries gone by, we seek to provide Christian teaching that will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. Alliance Broadcasting includes the Bible Study Hour with Dr. James Boyce, Every Last Word with Bible Teacher Dr. Philip Ryken, God's Living Word, with Pastor the Rev. Richard Phillips, and Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, featuring Donald Barnhouse. For more information on the Alliance, including a free introductory package for first-time callers, or to make a contribution, please call toll-free 1-800-488-1888. Again, that's 1-800-488-1888. You can also write the Alliance at Box 2000, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. Or you can visit us online at AllianceNet.org. Ask for your free resource catalog featuring books, audio, commentaries, booklets, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians. Thank you again for your continued support of this ministry.